my name is Joseph Basic. I'm a kernel engineer, uh, software engineer at uh, Facebook, or Meta, I guess. Been here a while. Um, I've been one of the main architects and authors of ButterFS. I've been working on it for entirely too long. Um, uh, myself and Chris Mason uh, worked on it for quite a while, and now we have, you know, a fair bit more people. This is just sort of like a, you know, a good acknowledgement. This project's been going on for a while. Uh, it's obviously not just um, a couple of us. We have uh, Sousa, and in fact, our main maintainer is from Sousa, David Sturba. Uh, Western Digital, Meta, obviously, Oracle, Synology, um, Fedora. There's lots of, lots of people that contribute to this project every single day. We have about 11 act, like super active developers and you know, they're all up there, right? A good chunk of us are at Meta, a good chunk of us are at Sousa, a, you know, a good chunk at Western Digital and a couple from Synology and Oracle. Um, uh, we meet pretty regularly. We work really well together. Uh, we move pretty quick, probably about 700 patches every six months seems to be the current tempo. So doing a lot of work and with a lot of other contributors. Um, so this is about how we use it inside of Meta. Uh, Meta is huge. We have a lot of workloads. Um, so we have a lot of different use cases and even I discover use cases where people are like, oh, I am using ButterFS in this way and I find that out well after the fact, which is always super fun. Um, but just kind of like a high level overview, the root, root file system in the entire fleet is ButterFS. Um, we do this for a lot of reasons, mostly bec for uniformity, uh, but because we heavily use C groups and um, uh, resource uh, isolation and ButterFS is what works. Uh, additionally, because um, we want the compression features that ButterFS provides. So ButterFS, you can have um, uh, transparent compression turned on, so you just, you know, Mount O compress. You can you can be more granular. We can we do ZSTD, uh, LZ, GZ. Um, you can specify uh, compression levels if you're like really want as much spacing giving as possible, or if you want like decent trade offs. If you just mount O compress, we, you, we pick whatever the default is, and it gives you decent trade offs of like CPU usage versus savings. Um, the that and that was kind of like one of the original core things that was really valuable to 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 Meta. Obviously, we have uh, a few machines. We spend a lot of money on those machines and on those disks, um, especially SSDs. You know, figure we were probably you know ten years ago now. Uh, SSDs were not super great. Uh, life spans, right amplification tended to burn them out pretty quick. Uh, quick, easy way to uh, reduce right amplification is just not write to them as much. And so compression has saved us a not insignificant amount of money on, uh, on just drives themselves. Um, Meta is a container shop. Basically, every single workload that we have, with very few exceptions, are all containerized. Um, so, obviously, ButterFS lends itself really, really well to this. Uh, we, the container team, Tupperware, builds uh, a base image pretty regularly. Uh, base images um, shipped around with send and receive, and uh, so we 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 build the base image. We export it as a, um, a send image. We do ButterFS send. It spits out a, a uh, image that we can replay onto the main machine. Um, this send image is sent over the entire fleet. We're talking millions of machines. And then it is received onto those machines. So I, I don't know how often this happens. I think it's like several times a week. Um, yeah, OK, good. I've got my fact checker nodding his head over there. Um, so several times a week, these things are built and shipped around the entire fleet. Again, millions of machines, and ButterFS received onto them. And so this gives you a sub-volume with the base image 
from there, we can start tasks, and this receive is relatively quick. The base image last I checked is somewhere around 11 gigs um, compressed. Uh, it explodes out to like 22 or something like that. I, my numbers may be off. Um, from there, when you want to start a, a, a Tupperware, or when you want to stop it, start a job, the first thing we do is snapshot the, the base image. You download all the packages that you need for the, the application itself, which are also send images. So for all, mostly, um, most packages build them their own send images and we ButterFS receive those into the snapshot and then the, the thing launches. When it's all said and done, ButterFS snapshot deletes, cleans it all up, we roll on, keep on going. Um, that's that's kind of like the core use case for our for our, um, the the container side. Uh, the other side, and this is where this is the build system is a little less containery. It is just so it can fit in all of our regular infrastructure, but it it kind of just operates on its own thing. Um, they use and have used, and they have been our earliest adopters. These are the guys that just like showed up one day and were like, hey, we did this thing. <laughs> and we all were like, oh, sweet Lord, please no. Uh, but it worked really well, and we were really happy with it, and they were extremely happy with it. Um, we obviously, we have a lot of developers, 75,000 to 70,000 developers, somewhere in that range. Uh, they commit a lot of code because that's how they get raises. Um, so with that is continual testing, continual integration. You don't actually ever commit directly to the repo. The, the, the diffs are landed asynchronously. And to make sure all that happens, you have to make sure that they will apply. So part of this is the build system maintains a relatively recent copy of the Git or Mercurial checkout. It, expires every five minutes. So they're updating this thing every five minutes. And when you get a new diff, it snapshots the, the um, core repo, applies the diff, runs the tests, gives you your results, deletes the snapshot. This is happening literally hundreds of times a second. And again, this we went from the, that process of like applying a diff and running the test and that sort of thing. I, and this again was like seven or eight years ago, so there were a lot less developers. That process could take anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. It takes a couple minutes now. It's, and it's not the time to apply it, it's the time to run the tests and all of that. So we have like drastically increased our developer efficiency just with like the simple snapshot workflow. Um, we also have like really weird and esoteric uh, things inside of ButterFS because ButterFS does support, um, has multi-device support where you can have like built-in RAID and all that stuff. One of the things that we have is this concept of a seed device, which is a read-only like immutable object, um, which is really helpful for our rack switches because uh, we have security concerns there. So the idea is, is they are shipped a seed device image, which is like a base image, right? The CentOS or whatever. Um, they come up, they mount a, they add a scratch device to this seed device. And that is their writable layer. They can do whatever they want, like all the writing that needs to be done from being booted. Um, when they reboot, that completely goes away and is blown away. And they come back up with a completely pristine environment because the seed device has no idea. It's not saved. That is done entirely in memory. Um, and so this is how we kind of maintain this pristine and secure environment in our rack switches. By the way, I will just stand up here and talk forever. So if you guys have questions or whatever, there's a microphone up here. Which will, why are you down here? The microphone's right there uh, next to the projector. Yeah, um, so I, I just had a question about snapshots. So when you delete a snapshot, and do you do you return the space back to the file system? Because that that was, 
I, I used Btrefs some time ago, and when I tried that, it was, I, I noticed that I was still running out of space, even though I deleted old snapshots and created new ones. Right. So I was curious, like, is, uh, is there, are there tools to reclaim it, or is there a way to reclaim the space immediately? Like so when you so uh, what you might have run into is the, again, a lot has changed over the years. Um, the snapshots are deleted and the space is reclaimed immediately. The problem comes with snapshots are not free, right? So like you take a snapshot and you make a modification and you end up with like two copies mm. or you end up like if you modify a part in the middle of it, like the and the ref and the original copy still refers to a part of that extent. The whole extent has to stay there until okay. all of the references are dropped from it. Oh, okay. So yes. in an ideal world, because the snapshot goes away, that you know, there's no need for that data to be there, but you're saying the extent has to be there, so. Right, yeah, so if there's still references to parts of the extent, then this, the, the, the full extent has to stay. Okay. So anything that's new, like you create a snapshot and, and like in the build system case, you create a snapshot, you add a new patch, and this completely rewrites or adds new files, and you delete the snapshot, all of that space will be reclaimed. Okay. Got it. All right, yeah, thanks. Yep. That's, it's also sort of a lazy thing that happens in the background. So it's not like you delete the snapshot and all of a sudden you have all your space back. It's a process that takes place in the background. So um, our team, my company, you know, our team, we use this like ext4 uh, extensively. So let's say if I want to sell ButterFS to my team, what are the top three things that I should tell my team about ButterFS? So I, the thing about ButterFS is it works really well for like specific use cases. It is a general purpose file system, but there are gotchas, right? Um, what I would say is like if you're a, like a, a database user, like I wouldn't use ButterFS, I would use XFS or ext4, that works really well for that. But in the container case, and you use snapshots and you want to be able to like quickly you know, start things up in a pristine state and like remove them, that's really nice. If you have like data integrity requirements, um, we have checksumming, so like that's really nice. One of the thing, one of the fun things um, about ButterFS when I start, first started working at Meta is we found um, a bug in firmware where it would write to the middle of the disk and it had been corrupting user data for years because no other file system checksums data and so we hadn't noticed until ButterFS was in there. So if it's a thing that you care about, that's really helpful. Um, ButterFS does a lot of things that other file systems don't, but again, some of them are growing these features. XFS, for example, has reflink now, and reflink was a really fun thing that ButterFS has, you know, figure for like a VM, right? You want to create a new VM that's an exact copy. You can just ref link that and it's instantaneous compared to like a full on copy, pull all, everything up in the page cache and do it, write it out somewhere else. So, it, uh, Can I ask one more question? So um, I saw one of the, the feature here is basically in the, you can do some compression. Uh, as part of the compression, is it like single instance of a unique uh, block or something? So it, it's done based on, there's some heuristics in it. So as you're writing the, the file, it takes it in chunks. And so there are um, 128K chunks and we'll take it and we will run it through the compression algorithm. If it comes out compressed, great, and it keeps going. And that's, that's kind of the, the way it works. There's things like SquashFS and uh, like EROFS do this thing where they will like, they want it to fill up like they want the compressed size to fill up 4K. So they'll just feed in as much data as they can until they get their 4K and they'll move on to the next size. But RFS doesn't do that. We just take your 128K or however much you dirtied and compress that. And whatever that compresses down to is what you get. So we are not as efficiently compressed as something like SquashFS or EROFS. Obviously those are a different use case, but um, that's where the trade-off is. All right, thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on from technical questions to more maybe political questions. When do you see um, ButterFS coming back into the mainstream for a lot of operating systems? So it's in Fedora right now. It's the default for the Fedora desktop thing. Uh, Fedora desktop spin, sorry. Um, SUSE has shipped it forever. Uh, 
I don't really see like other distros I are free to make their own choices. I, it's OSSCon. I have to be more diplomatic up here. <laughs> um, the at the end of the day, like it's a new file system. Writing file systems is hard. I've been doing it for a long time, and I'm terrible at it. Clearly, um, so there is the very real and very valid concern of like, what do I do when things go wrong? And you know, Meta is able to deploy this and was able to deploy it early on because our answer for what is what do we do when things go wrong is reprovision the box. There was nothing valuable on there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not an option for like somebody with their laptop and their like kids' photos on it, right? And that's not really a thing that you want to like run the risk of. Um, that being said, I don't really, we haven't had those kind of problems for many years. Yeah. And that is a, not an attitude that changes quickly. XFS had the same problem. When we were started shipping, I, w I worked at Red Hat for a long time. Um, and when we started shipping XFS, everybody was like, well, this is terrible, it's gonna lose your data. But like XFS was like one of the fastest, most performant and most mature file systems. There was just this view that it was bad. And that just takes time for like people to kind of forget that. Confidence. Right, exactly. So, okay, uh, given that it is in production in such a wide scale at Meta, um, what is your confidence in the file system? I'm very confident. And okay. of everybody that would ever complain about ButterFS, I would be at the front of it because I know what's wrong yeah, with it. That makes sense. Right. I am extremely pessimistic. Between me and Chris, who have been working on the longest, like Chris Mason is very optimistic and I'm very pessimistic. Where we meet in the middle is probably reality. And I'm very happy and very confident in it. That's good. Um, okay, so I mostly use ZFS, for example, right? right? Um, ZFS really likes to own disks. It needs an HBA or a different type of direct SATA connection. Um, or direct NVMe connection, direct, direct PCI Express. Um, it doesn't like RAID controllers and such and such. Um, for ButterFS, is there that similar uh, requirement for when you're setting up such a system? No, we, we're very, very flexible. Like we'll run on anything. And like Synology, for example, um, I know they ship, they don't use our RAID. They use MD RAID and they put ButterFS on top of it. And which, oh, wow. Yeah, which honestly, like they use RAID 5, RAID 6, and they should do that because our RAID 5, no. RAID 6 is broken. Yeah. Um, it's deprecated. Right, it's deprecated. Yes. It's, it's going to be replaced soon. Mm. Um, so I, our aim has always been to be as flexible as possible. I know, like, I know ZFS like, makes their decisions, and I know why they make their decisions. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, for example, ZFS has been very, very um, adamant that you only run on ECC RAM, right? And there's a reason, because if something goes wrong in memory, you lose the entire file system. As I can point at many ButterFS use, unhappy ButterFS users with not ECC RAM, where their, their RAM corrupted a very important part of metadata, they, uh, lost, they lost track of stuff. Damn. So when you can control and like make those decisions, like, I totally get it. It makes a lot of sense, right? ButterFS has taken the opposite approach of giving you as much flexibility, but also, like, tell you the caveats and also put things in to make sure those sort of things don't happen. We have write time checks on, in ButterFS. It's not perfect, of course, but we have write time checks for the case of random cosmic rays or bad RAM or whatever. We don't want it to corrupt your system. Yeah, so. yeah, bit flips. So, okay, a couple of other questions, and then I'll stop hogging the mic. Um, what are the memory requirements for ButterFS, and what would you say the performance comparison is between ZFS and ButterFS? So, obviously, with you know ZFS, you can do lots of things, lots and lots, slogs or zills, or you can have many devices in what would traditionally be called uh, a, a mirror or a RAID 10, for example, right? Uh, like, I could have actually six drives in a RAID 10, but not have three groups, have two groups with hot spares, and those hot spares are actually active members of that mirror, right? So, right. Yeah. So, uh, so ButterFS doesn't do the thing that ZFS does, where it makes you like carve out the memory. So ZFS does that because they were on Solaris and they got to rewrite their whole MM, and they couldn't do that in Linux. Um, 
So ZFS has to like carve out memory to only use it. ButterFS doesn't do that. Like it's like any other file system. So the memory requirements are how much you're gonna use to like dirty stuff. And again, it's Linux, so like everything is handled. So there's never like a, we're never gonna freak out if you have too little RAM. Um, it's that's not a thing. There's no recommendation per terabyte of raw disk, for example. Right. Yeah. There's no recommendation. Like it'll just it will be slow, right? So like if you're if you're writing a lot of um, the way the MM works is like you have dirty thresholds. Right. So basically, like once you exceed by default, I think on rel it's twenty percent. It's like once you exceed twenty percent of the memory of dirty pages, like it starts flushing out. So if you have a terabyte of of disk that you're wanting to write to all of the time, but you only have a gig of RAM, uh, you're gonna start flushing at 200 meg, and uh, that's gonna be slower than if you had 20 gig or 200 gig. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in the same realm though, is that the developers for ZFS could have decided to not tell anyone that they needed an additional amount of RAM per terabyte of disk, for example, or not given that guidance, um, but their product would have been slower and they would have just said, well, get more RAM. What is the guidance uh, or comparative guidance from BTRFS? It's the same as any other file system. Like okay. any other, like ext4, xfs, butterfs, we're all going to be the same. The only way that butterfs is slightly different from everybody else is that we dirty significantly more metadata. Mm -hmm. So I would say that if you were wanting to like have some sort of guidance, it's you know kind of dependent upon how much metadata you generate. But you would approximate it closer to ext4 or ZFS versus, or sorry, um, or XFS, XFS versus ZFS? Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Okay. Yep. Cool. Um, in terms of the feature like uh, snapshot and ap apply div on the base image, it's, it sounds the butterfly system is uh, very close to the other system. I'm. I'm using like uh, for QEMO, um, QEMO, um, it's a uh, Q Q Q yeah. and uh, Docker a couple of years ago, it's using over overlay uh, file system. Yep. In the terms of feature, it sounds very similar. Uh, can you give, give us uh, some comparison in the tag, um, the difference between this, uh, this, this system with uh, Butterfly and uh, which you recommendation? Why right. uh, and, the, and the the other question is why the other community like uh, uh, QML and uh, Container uh, Docker or Kubernetes is not using Butterfly. So so QML uses QCow two for their image formats and it's a cow it's a it's a cow image format which is similar to ButterFS, which is cow file system. Uh, they just have sim they simply have different requirements right it's a different use case like they're only interested in like maintaining their image thing and being able to snapshot the actual images themselves they don't want to have to implement a file system they want to implement an, an image thing so that's that's kind of why it's different um, as for overlay fs and docker and all and kubernetes and all that stuff uh, overlay fs makes more sense in like a general case if you have a lot of different file systems and it, and i know um a long time ago when they were making this decision you know, they had users that were on XFS or ext4 or whatever that don't have snapshot capabilities. And OverlayFS is a nice, quick, easy way um, to to get the similar sort of behavior uh, with anything. You can do it with NFS, you can do it with tempfs, you can do it with XFS, ext4. So it gives them the most flexibility for the most customers. Cool. I did not update that slide very well. Okay. Well, I put the same thing on there twice. Uh, one of the other uh, the use cases that we've had recently is um, uh, MySQL uses has this thing called bin logs, where they like log every change to the the, the database. If I remember, if I read it correctly. Um, so the way our, our MySQL setups are is they have root file system was ButterFS, and then they have giant fast disk, which is XFS for the actual database, and then they they take that giant disk and they carve um, like 200 gigs or 300 gigs out of it for bin logs. And so it used to be bin log had XFS and, and data, the rest of it was XFS. And then the bin log would just get recycled whenever it got to like an 80% threshold. Well, they turned on 
uh, ButterFS for this for to use the compression to see if it affected performance. Didn't affect performance. Um, and they got like a 50% or 45%. Um, I always do this wrong. The data compressed down to 45% of the original size. So they could they cut their um, bin log partition in half, which reclaimed about 5% of their global capacity, which when you're, again, at Facebook at scale, 5% of your global data capacity uh, is measured in hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Um, the other big thing, this is, this used to be a bigger brag. Uh, it's not so much anymore, but um, when we were doing, uh, we were also big proponents of C group V2. Tejan did a lot of work there. Um, and we wrote, and he wrote io.cost, which is a, um, uh, does IO isolation because we want to be able to stack workloads and we don't want workloads affect um, IO storming the, the disk and affecting the other workloads. Um, at the time, ButterFS was the only one that this worked well with, obviously because we cared about it. And so we did all the patches and made it work. Um, XFS should work fine. EXT4 will ne doesn't just by design, that's not like, this is not me saying XT4 is bad. It's just the way it's designed. You have an inherent priority inversion. Um, but the other big thing that ButterFS does is um, async discard. Uh, we buy a lot of disks, and some of them are very bad. And discard is very important because I've got wonderful graphs of where we forgot to turn on discard, and latencies just slowly creep up until like the service falls over. So you have to have discards. Unfortunately, um, some discard some drives like to just check out for 20 seconds while they're doing a discard, which is also problematic. Um, and these, these sort of like latencies affect services, and this is a problem. So um, we did a lot of work to do asynchronous discards to not only async them off, but also limit them. Make sure we're only doing like 10 IOPS or 100 IOPS or whatever. And this kind of allowed us to get rid of all the like the discard related latencies in the fleet. I don't know. I totally copied this thing wrong. Cool, buzzing right wrong. All right, so uh, we've done a lot of work in recent years. Um, obviously, we spent a lot of time on stabilization, so now we're able to work on features again, which is fun. Um, the send stream stuff has been basically the same for since it was written. Uh, this year, we finally got like the last big bits for send stream v2. Um, this includes encoded read and writes. Before, with send stream, if you like take a sub volume and say, I want to create a send volume with this, if it's compressed, it decompresses the data and spits out the uncompressed data into the image. And then on the other side, it'll write the uncompressed data. And then if you have compression on it, it'll recompress it, right? The encoded read and write stuff allows us to lift the, the already compressed data off, export the compressed data into the, the image, and then on the other side, write the, the already compressed data directly to the disk. So this avoids like the decompress, recompress thing. Um, and then additionally, there was just like F allocate support before we didn't have a way to like tell you that you had F allocated. Um, and now we can just say, okay, there's an F allocate instead of filling in zeros. Um, if you've seen me talk about this before, I've talked about how I almost brought down most of Facebook with a pretty bad problem in SideButterFS where the way we, you know, this this workload that I described where we're like blowing big files onto the disk and then deleting them and then blowing big, this is how we do the, the um, container stuff. This would actually make it, the way ButterFS does space management is like we have data and metadata chunks and doing this constantly was fragmenting the data area and to the point where we'd fill the entire disk up with data chunks. And then some other service would go along and start spewing empty files to the disk, which uses metadata. And then we would run out of metadata space and then the whole box would go down and need to be reprovisioned. Um, so ButterFS was doing the right thing here, which is you, you're writing a big chunk. We don't have enough space for that chunk 
or enough space for that extent, we allocate a new chunk to fit it in there so you get nice big contiguous extents. Uh, this works really well, this is what we want. However, as little other things were writing in, they were filling in these new um, block groups with little stuff. So when we went to delete these big files, there were still little extents left in all of these block groups, then we couldn't reclaim them. Um, so one of our engineers, Boris, worked on this and um, did a lot of work to make the fragmentation and this, especially this workload behave a lot be better. So in production, we don't see this problem anymore, which is really nice. Um, and then additionally, um, zone device support. This is still like upcoming from, uh, from device manufacturers, but like SMR drives, ZNS drives. Um, the ZNS stuff is still a little bit more experimental because it has this concept of, uh, of active zones. You're only allowed to like write to certain zones at a certain time. Um, and so work is still being done there. But the base work is there and it's part of the continual integration testing that I have. I have ZNS drives that do this. So it's working pretty well. And the RAID support is coming soon. And with that, with the work needed to do RAID on zoned, it'll have the work for um, erasure coding and some of the more fancy RAID stuff. Um, this is the Sunstream V2 thing. This is like our fancy graph. Um, the, this is the base image times, this is pure in isolation in product, like in before what we had was the Sunstream V1, which is the base image. And then we would compress the, the end result. And then on the other end, we download this compressed thing. We Z cat it and ButterFS and pipe it into ButterFS receive. So that takes about two seconds, um, uh, with the, the old thing and but because you have to compress on the back end you eat up a lot of time compressing that data asynchronously as you're writing it so it shows here about four and a half seconds of time being compressed with sendstream v2 the um the receive time is a little bit a little bit faster it's about one three quarter seconds um, there's barely any CPU that's needed because there's far less instructions because we're just doing the encoded read and writes. We're not having to write as big chunk, as many chunks. Um, with this, of course, this cascades to system and CPU savings. Um, and then the compressed async thing is the big savings. Because we get to write the already compressed extents to the disk, we don't have to recompress them. So we pay the cost of compressing them once when we build the image, but on the receive, which again happens on millions of machines multiple times a week, we don't have to pay the cost, the CPU cost of um, recompressing it. And again, when power usage is a, an important thing that we measure, like this is again, a pretty significant savings cost. I think the, the uh, napkin math we did was Again, hundreds of millions of dollars in savings and just in power usage. Um, this is the allocator fixes thing. This is this is from my, we have a, a tool that does continual performance testing, runs every day, generates all these fancy graphs that I can stare at to make sure I didn't break anything. Um, this particular graph is the, um, th this is a FIO job that uh, mirrors the behavior of what was happening in production. And the, the value is the number of block groups that are fragmented. And this is, means that they have like more than 50%. Basically it takes like number of, the amount of space and subtracts the used and counts up the number of extents that are in there. So if you have like one extent that uses half of the space, that's not very fragmented. But if you have a thousand extents that uses up half of the space, very fragmented. Um, so as you can see, it's kind of noisy before. Let's see if you can spot when the allocator fixes went in. Like that bit at the end is it shows we just have one block group that's fragmented and that's the metadata for block group and it's gonna show fragmented because you know, every metadata extent counts as an extent. So pretty significant behavior change. And this has allowed us to roll back a lot of our mitigations that we had in place to um, to deal with this this behavior, and again, significantly less I/O to the disks, 
and uh, you know quite a bit of savings. Uh, future work. This is the fun stuff. Um, per sub volume authenticated encryption via FScript. Uh, FScript has been really great for like um, ext4. Uh, the nice thing about ButterFS is because we have checksum tree and we checksum everything, we can do the fancier cryptography that generates um, authenticated hash and store that. So that gives us more security than just standard FS script can give you. Um, that will allow us to like, this is really fancy because we can start containers, we can generate a per container key at runtime set up the subvolume with its per container key, throw that key away once we're done with the container and delete the snapshot. And there's no way you can recover that thing because we generated that key at start time. So the data is encrypted and safe while the task is running. And then as soon as the task stops and we throw that key away, the that data will never be able to be recovered. So it's, again, for a social media company where we have in uh, user data, we uh, want to protect it as much as possible. Um, simple quotas is coming next. Uh, we have quotas in the form of key groups. Uh, it turns out to be turned out to be um, too heavy-handed and uh, just bad. Um, it's too slow. Uh, it's not super usable in its state. So simple quotas is our way to address that, where you get you lose a lot of the like fine-grained accounting that you had in key groups um, and you're trading it for speed. So like now, now you get, and again, we care about this internally, like we can give a container a set amount of space and if they lose their minds, they'll, they'll run into the limit and it won't affect performance because again, Meta cares a lot about performance. The Radio Stripe tree, I've I mentioned a couple times. This is from uh, Western Digital. They're mostly using this to get what they need for um, zoned RAID support. But uh, this will this paves the way for erasure coding, which is kind of like the, the next, this is what we're going to replace the RAID 5, RAID 6 stuff with. Um, Extentry v2, this is my big thing. Um, again, I've been working on this a while. There are some pretty significant uh, scalability issues that are starting to crop up, uh, especially when you start running multiple containers on the same file system. Um, they don't really affect us, but it's one of those things where I can, if I wanted to be really mean to ButterFS, I definitely can be, and I can make it look real stupid. So uh, Extentry v2 is me reworking. It's kind of a, like an umbrella term for about five unique changes that I'm making to the disk format to kind of address a lot of these scalability issues that have not really, they don't really come out in real life, but they could in the future. And this is kind of future-proofing ButterFS for the next 20 years. Um, and then finally, page cache sharing. This is where the overlayFS thing also gets us because overlayFS lets you point at the same file like glibc, for example, you overlay FS 20 containers and they're all pointing at the same file. That file only takes up one spot, like however big it is in memory. With ButterFS, if you take a bunch of snapshots, 50 snapshots of the same thing, you're gonna end up with 50 copies of glibc in memory. Um, and the same works for like reflink, like, and it's the same for ButterFS or XFS with reflink. Because they end up being different files, they're different inodes with different memory, and so you end up with more memory usage. Yep. Um, thank you for sharing that future work. Uh, one other question I had about uh, some future changes. Um, how does BTRFS look with uh, NVMe over Fabric and also with DPUs? So those are, those are the two big new up and coming things that I've seen. So the NVMe over Fabric stuff, uh, it works pretty well. So we have some fancy stuff in, internally that we use. Uh, that works really, really well. Weirdly well, that, this was another, not the NVMe over Fabric, but like disaggregated storage. Um, that was another case where I got a user come into me two years after they already deployed it and said it was working fantastically. Mm -hmm. And having had to have spent a bunch of time fixing hangs and other file systems from like l l cases where things go wrong and ButterFS handled it well, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, so I, for up and coming stuff, I'm, I'm really happy where we are at. Nice. For DPUs, um, offloading storage uh, 
processing to the NIC. Right. So you have another operating system on a PCI Express device, and uh, that is doing either transactions or, uh, in the case of networking, maybe firewall rules or virtual NICs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, basically offloading a lot of CPU-related um, functions from your, your main hypervisor processor or another type of processor, it doesn't matter. Um, what kind of integration uh, have you seen with BTRFS and the use of these PCI Express operating systems? So the, this is the fun thing about being in the kernel is we don't have to think about this. So we use the generic crypto and the generic, um, well, it's all the crypto subsystem, but it has all that stuff. So if you have all of these offload devices that do these fancy things for us, like I just get it for free because I just call into the crypto thing and say, go do this thing. And if there's an offload system behind it, then great, I get it for free and it's fast. Are you familiar with any offload systems that are in place right now? I, uh, I'm not, I don't know, so. I don't. I don't okay, know. I'll look yeah. into it. Yeah, I, like Thank you. I'm. I'm running the LSFM M conference upstairs, and like this is a thing that comes up pretty regularly. But then I, you know, ask the storage guys, like, "Hey, where is this? Oh, it's coming." So I know that that we do have it for crypto for some things, and I know those are deployed. We don't have them internally. I don't think. I, I don't think we have any internally. I know they exist. And I know that the crypto subsystem does use them. So if they were there, they will be used. So the whole idea of having efficient processes, right? Right. So, yeah, you can have efficiency ports within the CPU, or you can offload to a client CPU. Right. And part of the reason we chose CRC32C is because at the time, uh, most CPUs had a, a specific instruction for it. So our, our checksum was extremely fast because of that. Right. Cool. Uh, and that's my time, guys. So. I appreciate it, and uh, I'll be hanging around here. And I'm at a conference upstairs, so if you got questions, come see me. Thanks, everybody.